Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is June 22nd, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, the New Republic says Trump's speech sounded like an InfoWars article? Yep. Hard hitting, pulled no punches, and he backed up what he said. She gets rich, making you poor. These funds were paid to the Clinton's bank account directly while Hillary was negotiating with China on behalf of the United States. Then, congressional Democrats holding a sit-in while a marshmallow lefty blogger whines that an AR-15 bruised his shoulder. Oh. And the vote on whether Britain will leave the European Union will be held tomorrow. Lord Moncton explains why Brexit is part of the movement against the globalist efforts to eradicate democracies worldwide. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com with an extremely important message. You're probably asking yourself right now, what's the most important phrase in America right now? Well, it happens to be Hillary for prison. Get your Hillary for Prison t-shirt today at the InfoWars store for $9.95. That's half of what it used to be at $19.95. Why do you want to get this? Why should you buy this for you and your friends and family? Because number one, it's a great conversation starter. And number two, hell, you get to trigger a whole lot of crazy liberal commie bastards. And that's what I like to do. And maybe you're just at work right now and it's casual shirt Friday and one of your hipster buddies walks in with a Hillary Clinton shirt saying I'm with her. Negative. This is what you're going to do. You're going to stand up and go, ah, Hillary for prison! Benghazi! <laughs> what difference at this point does it make? Go to InfoWarsStore.com and get your Hillary for prison shirt today for $9.95 and trigger more assholes like him. Come on, Hillary. Just a little. Just a little sip. Open up. Come on, take it. Take it! Everywhere I look, I see the possibilities of what our country could be. But we can't solve any of these problems by relying on the politicians who created the problems themselves. We'll never be able to fix a rigged system by counting on the same people who have rigged it in the first place. And that was just one of the snippets from Donald Trump's speech today. Now, it was a few weeks ago he promised that he was going to come after Hillary, and at the time he said it would be around then. But it seems like now is the time for Mr. Trump. He's coming out guns blazing, if you will. And it's getting to the point where people are talking all about this speech, uh, different parts of it. But my favorite article, uh, David Knight gave this to me a little bit earlier. Donald Trump just gave his most presidential speech, and it still sounded like an InfoWars article, which I thought was uh, quite the laugh there. Now, uh, in the in the speech, he said many things. He also said Mrs. Clinton was corrupt and rigged, and uh, he got a good line in. This is their words on the New Republic. Hillary Clinton got rich making you poor. So this is what they decided to point out about uh, Mr. Trump's speech. And they say uh, Trump's case was riddled with lies, BS, and conspiracy theories. He relied heavily on one widely discredited book, Clinton cash. Now, I haven't personally read the Clinton cash, so I can't really speak to its uh, validity. But the issue is uh, anything that they don't like is discredited. And I was talking to uh, one of the guys in the back. He was saying that his friend hates Infowars, hates Donald Trump. And once again, I'm not a Trump guy, but they hate everything we stand for. But they love Mrs. Clinton, but they get all their news from CBS, which I thought was really funny, because if you just go to the CBS thing, you see these big banners. I'm with her, I love Hillary, you know, everything's about Hillary Clinton, you know, hugging puppy dogs and, you know, handing out cake to poor kids and all that stuff. But the issue is, if you go back uh, to the archives of CBS, they have this great thing, I think it was uh, Cheryl Atkinson, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Clinton, when she was in Bosnia, saying that she was dodging sniper fire, and uh, Trump mentioned that in his speech today as well. This person who wants you to trust them to run the free world throws out this whopper of a lie. This isn't... You know, some itty bitty thing, like a slightly out of proportion, slightly sensationalized. She took an event that never happened, just like Lion Brian Williams, and said, oh, we were dodging sniper fire. And if you go back and watch those videos, she stops and she gets flowers and she's signing autographs for little girls. Then it goes way beyond that. What, the reason why I don't like Hillary Clinton. Also, when you talk about Benghazi and they try to downplay, downplay, downplay Benghazi. Because this is my argument to people. 
let's say that the email scandal is completely overblown. Other people do it, whatever else. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. I'll take that argument, but at the same time, Benghazi has been greatly underplayed. Because if you look at the situation with Ambassador Stevens, could they want to tell you that it was, uh, you know, some anti-Muslim film that was basically like a live action version of South Park that set people off and they decided to go burn down the Benghazi consulate. Well, if you read the cable sent by Ambassador Stevens months before he was actually murdered, he was sending these cables, hey, uh, I feel unsafe here, we need more security. And what they do, they responded by giving him less security. So those are things I don't like about Mrs. Clinton going back uh, through her history. It's not anything uh, cosmetic like she wears pantsuits or anything that they want to uh, spin off on that. And it's not just that where they're talking about Hillary Clinton. Now people are taking exception to a uh, great piece of marketing, I guess you could say, the Hillary for Prison t-shirt. And they're coming after uh, the t-shirt here in Slate. And they're talking about the story of a professional poker player and a contestant on Survivor, Survivor was standing at the entrance. This is in uh, Vegas to one of the Trump's speech. And she is wearing a Hillary for Prison t-shirt 2016. And they were just so shocked and offended and triggered and all the rest of it because she had a Hillary for Prison t-shirt. You have the right to wear what kind of t-shirt you want. And this is my argument with that. If you could say that Trump is Hitler and Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer and you can say Bernie Sanders is Colonel Sanders and all the other memes that are out there with all the other presidential contenders that you know have uh, since dropped off. But regardless, if you can make fun of those people, why can't you say that Mrs. Clinton should go to prison? And I think that's just a great way. Thank you so much. Uh, what is this slate for hyping up the shirt? And it just so happens that we're running a special on the shirt right now at the InfoWars shop. You can get yourself a great Hillary for Prison t-shirt and you get the second one for 75% off. That is a limited time deal. It's a great way to uh, meet like-minded people. You can uh, make Slate mad and you can, <laughs> and you can uh, be the star of the show to, for just showing up with your Hillary for Prison t-shirt. You can get the official InfoWars one. There are other, you know, third party ones, but you can get our official one at the InfoWars shop. And it's a great way to piss off a liberal. So get your Hillary for Prison t-shirt today. All right, now let's move on to some other news, some more serious news. As we talk about things uh, the DOJ does. Now, a lot of times when I speak about the DOJ, it's usually not in the most polite ways, whether it's, you know, Fast and Furious, many other scandals as well. But now we see this. DOJ touts 90 million Medi Medicare fraud takedown, the largest ever. The government says 300 people have been charged this year in health care fraud sweeps across the country. That includes physicians, clinic owners, and other healthcare professionals accused of bilking Medicare. In all, the fraudulent billings allegedly totaled $900 million, the Justice Department said. Authorities called it the largest ever national Medicare fraud dragnet. More than 55 million people receive Medicare. So just as we see here, nothing is immune to corruption. People can take advantage of the system. They can game the, game the system. Like they said, uh, the people here were clinic owners and doctors and other people who participated in this fraud. So when you go to the hospital and you think you're getting the best deal and they're trying to help you out, I'm sure most of them are. I will say that. I'm sure most of them have the best of intentions, but you do have those who game the system and they try to steal from you. And it's, as I've heard it described by many people, it's really not health care, it's sick care. Because if you think about this, and once again, I'm sure doctors, nurses, people in the medical field have the best of intentions. I'm talking about the trickle down effect of the people who actually make the drugs or, you know, do the procedures or, uh, uh, regulate the procedures, I guess, is more of what I was getting at there. You can cure somebody of a disease, let's, hypothetically, let's say you can cure somebody of a disease in three years, or you can treat them for 30 years or until they die. Uh, which of those has more money in it? It's, you know, you, you bilk the system as it were. You know, it, there's no money in curing somebody when you can treat them for a lifetime, but they say that's a conspiracy theory, so you believe what you want. Uh, I think there are definitely ways out there that are not the traditional West, westernized medicine when it comes to getting yourself better. Now, let's talk about getting something better, and that is the reputation of the AR-15. It has been demonized unmercilessly uh, since Orlando, but if you go back to uh, previous shootings here in fairly recent American history, uh, people have actually used the AR-15, but it was not used in Orlando. And because it looks similar enough to an AR-15, to the layman, they keep saying it was an AR-15, it was an AR-15. 
So much to the point that liberals are actually going out and shooting these guns and saying you know, how traumatized they are by it. Now, real quick, this is just something off the top of my head. I remember when Pierce Morgan came down here, uh, was it 2012, 2013, you know, a lot of us in the crew, we went down there to see him at Houston and he had that conversation with Alex. And he's shooting a fully automatic gun and you can see clearly in the video that he is trying not to smile. He's having a great time shooting all these guns, you know, probably went out and had some, you know, uh, barbecue afterwards, got some spurs and a cowboy hat and the whole nine. But he wants to say that, you know, you shouldn't really have these uh, killing machines. But specifically, I want to mention somebody who shot an AR-15 and said it was so uh, detrimental to their health, it hurt their shoulder and it gave him PTSD, even though you can see, you know, skinny, you know, 16 year old high school girl shooting them on, uh, on YouTube just fine. But this guy said that it gave him PTSD and it made him feel bad and it, you know, hurt his shoulder and all this. And this is a rebuttal to that. This is the guy who actually said, I'm not going to shoot the gun on my shoulder. I'm going to shoot it on my nose. And you can see how that works out. Video in response to Mr. Constant's article, which I'm going to link with the video. The article said shooting an AR-15 was terrifying, caused a case of PTSD, and bruised his shoulder. Now, as I'm about to demonstrate, the recoil on this rifle cannot cause bruising on your shoulder, even if held improperly. Let me put my air protection in real quick, and we will demonstrate. I'm going to fire this weapon off the tip of my nose. Not broken, not bleeding, not bruised. Thank you for your time. Now, earlier this week, we brought you the news how many gun control bills failed, and now they're actually, uh, actually having a sit-in to bring attention to gun control and this is being led by Congressman John Lewis. It says, sometimes you have to do something that's out of the ordinary. Sometimes you have to make a way out of no way. And then basically they say that they started chanting, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and no bill and no break while they were out there protesting uh, the failure of the gun bills. Now, I'm sure if you went out and talked to all these people individually, you'll get different answers as to what they think is the best answer to gun violence in this country. But this is what I always tell people. They say, well, how can you be for all the gun violence in the country? I'm like, I'm not for gun violence in the country. I'm not for liquor store robberies. Joe Biggs is not for uh, shooting up a school. Alex Jones is not for bank robberies. Nobody is touting gun violence as the way to go. We support self-defense. We support the Second Amendment. We support the right to bear arms. As I always say, the shotgun in my closet has never shot anybody, and I hope it never will. It's there in case I need it. Now, with that said, these people have to understand that with the bills that they are trying to pass here recently, which one of those would have passed, if, if passed, would have stopped the recent shooting in, in Orlando? Because you're talking about a guy who uh, went through the background check system. You know, he had been uh, looked at by the FBI. People even called the FBI on him. Multiple people who said they had a relationship with him of whatever kind said, hey, this guy went to my mosque or they were in a you know, romantic relationship with him, whatever. They were calling the police, say, hey, I think this guy is dangerous. You need to look at him. So you have all this stuff going on. How did that, any of that stop the shooting that took place? You know, the background checks wouldn't have done it. Banning assault weapons that are already banned, that wouldn't have done anything. I just don't understand the logic of the people who keep saying we need to ban things like Hillary coming out and banning uh, sniper rifles. The guy didn't use a sniper rifle. It's obvious if you look at it, that's not what it is. So people keep trying to pass things that would have done nothing to stop that shooting. You need to look at other aspects as to what motivated the guy in the first place, not saying that because this guy owned a gun that looks similar to an AR-15, we have to take an AR-15 from everybody else, the millions of other people who own them and have had uh, no incident with them. It makes absolutely no sense. As I always say, it's easy to ban something you don't own or an activity that you don't participate in. I always give the example, I don't drink. I could say, let's ban uh, alcohol tomorrow. And everybody say, else would say, well, let's not do that because we had an alcohol prohibition and that didn't work out. And I would say you're exactly right. You had people, uh, violent crime shot up, shot up overnight. You had uh, other things going on, bootleggers, you know, the speakeasies and all that. It wasn't a very effective way to go about it. The same thing's going to happen if you come out and just blanket ban all the firearms. And as we were talking about uh, Congressman John Lewis there, I really think that the guy should take a look at his own personal life when you come to these background checks and saying, if you have no fly, you have no buy, because he's actually on the no fly list. And this is a United States congressman. 
He uh, reports that he had been denied access to an airplane at least 35 times. And this is a, a congressman. Like I said, we talk about the kids and the other people who have similar names to uh, actual suspected terrorists. This guy is a congressman and he has to call his office and show his press ID or his uh, national ID or whatever else. And he says, hey, I'm not this guy you think I am. And they still deny him. So how much more would somebody who doesn't have those credentials have to go through these type of experiences? And the United States government doesn't fly from, pay for me to get on an airplane and fly around. This guy can just you know, charge it to the state. Everybody else, you have to eat the cost of that ticket. This is definitely not something that you want to roll out blanket uh, with this no fly, no do anything else until that system is fixed. And as we're talking about guns and all the gun violence and what would have stopped this or what wouldn't have, uh, let's take a look at the guy who tried to assassinate Donald Trump. And even the Washington Post is coming out and saying, why isn't the assassination attempt of a United States presidential contender bigger news? Well, that makes a very good point there, uh, Washington Post, because when you consider the guy, his name was Michael Stanford, or Sanford is Michael Sanford. Uh, he's a 20-year-old British citizen who was in the United States illegally overstaying his visa. He also allegedly, allegedly in quotes, so that's my emphasis, try to pull a gun from the holster of a police officer at a Trump rally in Las Vegas. Now, you have a guy, he's here illegally, he's not of age to own a pistol, you have to be 21, and he tried to steal one from a police officer. So I don't know how many of <laughs> the crimes the guy has to commit before, even if he had got the gun, right, and he, and he tried to aim it, before he pulled the trigger, he committed what, what was that, four crimes right there? Uh, I, I don't know how much more blatant you can be than this a uh, background check wouldn't have stopped this guy banning assault weapons wouldn't have stopped this guy uh ammunition shortages in your magazine that wouldn't have stopped this guy all these things that people are trying to pass wouldn't have stopped this guy because if you really want to hurt somebody he got to the point where he is willing to steal a firearm from a police officer but he builds robots in his spare time so that's okay and it shouldn't be a big deal now let's talk quickly about the senate and their attempts to give the fbi access to your browsing histories without a court order it says private privacy minded senators on Wednesday blocked an amendment that would have given the FBI power to your Internet records, including browsing histories and email metadata without a court order. That's called the Fourth Amendment. And you guys should definitely look that up. And finally, this is something that has got some news, but I, I think it needs more attention. This is a Yazidi woman and she was held captive by ISIS. And she's saying that these guys definitely need to be put in check for the actions, and she actually testified in front of Congress. And these type of things happen regularly. Not always, uh, you know, people coming from foreign countries, but uh, people who have been wronged, uh, sexually abused, or whatever. These are great things that you need to watch. They're very educational. I definitely encourage you to go watch them in your spare time. Well, that's it for this segment. Stay tuned after this break for more special reports. Three Syrian refugees reportedly raped a little girl at Knife Point in Idaho before urinating on her body, an incident that prompted furious residents to accuse Twin Falls City Council members of covering up the assault. The sexual assault allegedly took place on June 2nd, but has received virtually no media attention aside from one vague KMVT report. However, residents have been circulating what really happened on social media, with the creeping Sharia blog reporting that the victim was a young girl who was born premature and is less developed for her age. The victim's grandmother found the victim and then called the girl's mother who called the police. The police took two and a half hours to arrive, but were unable to take any action due to the language barrier. When she arrived, the mother of the alleged rapist was only able to say, no police, while the father reportedly congratulated his 13-year-old son. Video of the entire assault was captured on the boy's cell phone. But according to the Idaho statesman, the Twin Falls County prosecutor, Grant Loeb, says there were no Syrians involved, there was no knife involved, and there was no gang rape. Loeb continued, There is a small group of people in Twin Falls County whose life goal is to eliminate refugees, and thus far they have not been constrained by the truth. They have not been constrained by the truth in the past, and I don't expect them to be constrained by the truth in the future. Truth. These supposed city leaders would have the good people of Twin Falls believe there isn't any invasion of psychotic refugees gradually flooding the United States that will soon resemble the horror transpiring in Europe. Just listen to your elected leaders. They know best, right?
Well, so the first item is uh, general public input. If there is anyone here from the public who wishes to address the council on an issue that is not on tonight's agenda, now is your chance to please come forward. We've been made aware of a uh, situation, an alleged assault of a minor child, and uh, we can't get any information on it. Apparently, it's been indicated that it was uh, the perpetrators were four Muslim youth that uh, conducted this uh I guess it was rape, and we've heard that it's consensual, but my concern is there's no such thing as consensual rape of a minor. I am telling you, I am not aware of a news story about allegations of an assault against a minor in our community by Islamists. Idaho's First News has confirmed that a reported sexual assault around the Fonbrook Apartments in Twin Falls is being investigated by the Twin Falls Police Department. The incident allegedly occurred on June 2nd. Twin Falls County Prosecutor Grant Lopes has confirmed the investigation but says there will be no charges filed in the case until the investigation is complete. Unconfirmed reports concerning the case are circulating on social media, but no one will comment officially on the case while it is still under investigation. Where is the national media on this story? The only outrage is actually from the politically correct downplaying the crime, as Snopes.com has labeled the information circulating on the web as mostly false, and it appears Loeb actually was right, technically. The minors accused of the assault weren't Syrian. They were from Sudan and Iraq, and the rest of the details are hidden from public view because minors committed the heinous act. Loeb's BS is correct. But rather than protect America's children by getting to the bottom of it and calming any fears brewing within the local community, the Twin Falls City Council would have anyone concerned branded a bigot and a white supremacist. The council was also grilled as to how a mosque was approved after just 24 hours, whereas a new home application would take at least two weeks just to process. Just another blatant example of what may be coming to, or without you even knowing, is currently happening in your community. You might look at us and think that we're some kind of a coalition of weirdos, and, and actually there's professionals, there's business owners, there's college graduates. We're not just a bunch of weird people. We're people that are living here in this community paying our taxes. We're nationals of somewhere in the United States or Idaho. And we have what we feel, anyway, are legitimate concerns. Due to mounting pressure from the Twin Falls community, the families of the boys accused of the assault have since been evicted. John Baum for Infowars.com. So we have an introduction, of course. If you're a listener to Infowars.com, you've heard him on many times. We have... Uh, Lord Moncton on to talk. He is an expert on global warming. He's been very effective at fighting the lies of Al Gore and others, uh, the censorship that we see uh, surrounding uh, man-made global warming narratives. Uh, he's done that in the UK. Of course, he's also a businessman. He's a newspaper editor. He's an inventor, a classical architect, and of course, the high priest of climate skepticism. But today we're going to talk to him about what's going on with globalism. Also, if you want to uh, find Lord Moncton, you can find him at scienceandpublicpolicy.org, where you'll find many of his papers uh, published, and whatsupwiththat.com, where you'll find information uh, where he exposes the lies of climate alarmism. But today we're going to talk about Brexit. We're going to talk about the economic issues. We're going to talk about the sovereignty issues. We're going to talk about the political consequences, both in Britain and in the United States, because this is a worldwide issue that is happening right now. Joining us now is Lord Christopher Monckton. Thank you for joining us, Lord Monckton. Well, David, it's a pleasure to be with you. And my goodness, it's exciting here because I can't tell you who is going to win this vote tomorrow. I hope it's going to be the Brexiteers. Uh, I've already cast my vote by post, but it's too close to call. It could go either way. But you're quite right in your introduction and in that wonderful film and all of the people that, who you, you showed clips of are friends of mine. Um, this is an enormous blow. The fact that we've even got this referendum is an enormous blow against global government power. Yeah. They didn't ever want us to have this vote. And at least we've got the chance to have our say. 
And it's very evenly divided between, roughly speaking, the left and the centre-right, between the establishment and the ordinary folk, between the givers and the gobblers, to use the uh, <laughs> Rand's uh, metric. And what is fascinating is that practically the entire global establishment, so terrified are they, are they at the idea of Britain leaving the EU that we've had Mr. Obama speaking out, we've had Angela Merkel, the uh, president of Germany, speaking out, we've had, or the chancellor, as she's called, we've had uh, Francois Hollande speaking out, we've had the head of the World Bank speaking out, we've had all manner with the, the head of the Bank of England, who is not allowed to speak out of political matters, he has spoken out, and all of these are, of course, wanting us to stay in because they want to tie us in to this increasingly globalized government system. And, yes, and further and away, further life. away, we have no control over what's going on in your lives. And I think that's the key phrase there, that rousing speech that was given by Boris Johnson, where he says, tomorrow can be our Independence Day. I mean, do Britons really want to govern themselves or do they want to be governed by some European super state that is dominated by the Germans? I, I really don't understand that. I mean, there was a, a back and forth talking about Neville Chamberlain and, and they made a good uh, point on that the other day when they, they questioned uh, Cameron on that. I want to play that clip and get your reactions to it. But I, I see that as a, another issue of uh, appeasement and surrender. That is a very fair comparison. And of course, the entire establishment throughout Europe was for appeasement in the, uh, in the era immediately before the Second World War. And I'll bet you'll never guess which the first state to speak out against Hitler openly and publicly was. What was that? It was actually the Holy See. It was, it was the uh, hmm. Pope Pius XII, as he was to become, he was then secretary to Pope Pius XI, who issued in German an encyclical letter, the first time it hadn't been in Latin since the early Middle Ages. And it was called Mit Brennen der Sorge, with profound concern. The Holy See spoke out against the Hitler regime, while everybody else, the Times of London, was for appeasement. I mean, indeed, the Daily Express in 1933 had disgraced itself by running a front page story shortly after Hitler came to power saying Germany is Britain's friend. And the author of its lead story was not one of its journalists, it was Joseph Goebbels. That was <laughs> how much the establishment wanted the, the, the German Reich to survive and prosper. And now they want the new bureaucratic, the, the tyranny by Clark, which again is anti, it's not just undemocratic, it's anti-democratic. And again, the establishment, which now hates democracy, viscerally hates democracy, wants to use the EU as a model for spreading effectively dictatorship worldwide. Kid Daniels here with Infowars.com in Houston, Texas, outside the Shiloh Gun Archery Range. Now, this gun store recently made headlines for offering free CHL classes for the gay community after the Orlando shooting. And what was unexpected was the sheer volume of people who were interested in the classes. They've had hundreds of hundred people that signed up for the classes. Their phone lines have completely jammed, their voicemails got full. So let's talk to the owner and find out more. My name is Jeff Sanford. Uh, I'm the general manager here at Shiloh Indoor Shooting Range in Northwest Houston. We're a family owned and operated shooting range. Okay, what kind of classes are you offering for the gay community right now? Well, we're doing a free license to carry class for the LGBT community because uh, one of our customers and good friends of ours, his name is Ryan Thomas, and, and we were speaking to him after, uh, after Orlando happened and wanted to know, you know, I said, hey man, I know you carry, but we'd like to do something for, for your friends. And he was really distraught about it. And I, seeing as it was in Orlando and so far away, I, I personally didn't understand why he was so distraught. And then he explained to me that, you know, hey, these places are places that they feel like they can go anytime and that's the one place that they can feel totally safe. So even though it happens states away from us, it's affecting the community here tremendously as well. And so I said, well, man, let's let's do something for your friends. So tell, tell some of your friends, we'll give them a free, free license to carry class. And we thought that would be maybe one or two classes with 30 or 40 people total and so far, today uh, about two days after we announced it we're at either approaching or just past 300 students signed up what was supposed to be one or two classes is now 10 classes and about to open an 11th so what kind of public response did you get from this when you announced the class 
most of the response has been really, really overwhelmingly positive. You know, there's a few detractors, but you can't do anything without having at least a few detractors. And, um, you know, it's been it's been outstanding. We've had veterans that have called and said, hey, we want to come up and provide security for your classes. We have uh, police do- police officers that are off duty, spending their off duty time up here, volunteering their time to come up and provide security for the classes. Uh, I've had license to carry instructors from all over the state giving me a call saying, hey, man, I'll be more than happy to come up. I'll do anything from teaching the entire class to just pushing brass around the range when they're done shooting. We've had a tremendous amount of, uh, of goodwill from the, the shooting community as a whole. I think everybody realizes that this is a golden opportunity for us to take what has been a small percentage of our population at you know maybe 3.8% and really bring them into into our world you know they have not felt safe to be able to come to a place like a shooting range and while we may think why wouldn't you feel safe to go to a shooting range you know we're, we're great people here you know we're, we like to be friends with everybody the fact is is that i've talked to 300 people and none of them they've all told me the same thing we've never felt like that's the kind of place that we would belong and so we've put this off and put it off but now we can actually do it so this is a golden opportunity for us as gun owners as second amendment advocates to say hey come join us be part of be part of what we do and have an entire new range of uh of second amendment advocates out there for us 3.8 percent of the population takes legislation from a minor loss to a tremendous overwhelming victory if we can get that 3.8 percent and bring them into our world of self-defense and self-preservation have you had some uh people that showed up for the classes that never shot a gun before Almost all of them. Uh, That's been the thing, you know, out of the nearly 300 people that have signed up, out of all the ones that I've talked to, I think I've got maybe 10 that have their own firearm and have experience with a firearm. So we're trying to do our part to make sure that, you know, when they get their license to carry, you know, part of the the license to carry is doing a shooting qualification. So we've got everybody coming in an hour and a half before the license to carry starts so that we can do a training class, a a basic pistol one with them so that they can go in there and competently and confidently shoot their shooting test. So you think their perception of firearms in general has changed positively since they've took the class? Uh, You know, we're doing our first class right now and the group has been a lot of fun. And, uh, I definitely think that if we continue to do our part, then we're going to have a new wave of Second Amendment advocates out there. More advocacy for the Second Amendment. I hate to sound like a broken record, but that's what this is all about, you know. And there have been people that, you know, I've read the stupidest comments online from, oh, this is just a money grab to, oh, I guarantee they've raised the prices of their guns. Well, it's kind of hard to make money when you do something for free. You know, we did charge a nominal $25 fee for the training class and a, and a free rental gun, yeah. you know. Low cost. <laughs> very much, yeah, very much so. And, uh, but, and we haven't raised the price of anything else. The guns, the ammo, everything is the same price. This is about welcoming a new group and having a very loud and passionate group of people join us and trying to retain our rights when we have so many politicians right now, namely yeah, I would like to say only the Democrats, but if you, you know, Mitch McConnell is now in the fold. Well, he has been with them, but now we're hearing him with gun control. So, um, you know, we've got another group that we can bring in. 3.8% of the population doesn't sound like a large number, but it's a large number when you think about it legislatively. Well, how's gun sales been since the Orlando shooting? They were getting, they were, everything was ramping up before that anyway. You know, every time Hillary opens her mouth, she becomes the greatest gun salesman that, that we could ever imagine. So I'm going to speak out. I'm going to do everything I can to rally people against this pernicious, corrupting influence of the NRA. We've got to go after this. She sold more guns than the NRA could have ever um, I could have ever tried to do. Yeah, they, there's a gun store owner in Austin, Michael Cargill. He said the same thing about Obama. Yeah. Uh, well, we've been saying about that for him, about him for eight years. And now, uh, now that Hillary's doing the same thing, she's ready to take her salesman of the year mantle from him and put her face on it. Um, 
but yeah, man, it's it it has ramped up. Bulk ammunition sales have ramped up. Academy pulled their AR-15s from the shelves, and now they're reporting anybody that buys ten or more boxes of ammunition, what they consider high power, when a two twenty three is anything but a high power gun. And uh, and so that I've noticed a ton of my customers are coming in and they're coming to me and saying, OK, yeah, I'm, I'll pay two dollars more a box now because that's bull crap what they're doing over there. And I would rather support you than support them. Well, thank you. And we appreciate that. Yeah, is this the kind of the largest uh, popularity you've seen with classes so far? Every election season that comes in, the classes go through the roof. And this past, I think the the most that I've seen was after the San Bernardino shooting, because we had a combination of people being off for the holidays. We had the San Bernardino shooting, and then we had politicians talking about gun control. And our average license to carry class went from about 20, 22 people per class to 55 people per class. And we were running several classes a week that went from two classes a week to three or four classes a week, every one of them with 55 people in it, not to mention the 10 or 12 instructors that are outside instructors with their own license to carry businesses that were bringing their 35 to 60 students to qualify here. And so we were opening our doors at 6 a.m. for instructors to come qualify people. And by the time we'd open for business by 10 a.m., several hundred people had already qualified. So how many people do you expect now to show up for the classes? Uh, gosh, I'm thinking right now our class that for the previous few weeks has been sitting right around 18 students. I believe we're at 33. So it's only going to continue to grow. It's not going to get any lower. And so if you're waiting, if you're on the fence to get it, get your damn license. If you've already taken it and you haven't sent your paperwork in yet, the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take to get it back from the state because everybody is doing it. Just, um... You know, I, I would like to say to all my other gun shop owners, to the gun shop, gun range owners, to licensed to carry instructors out there, this is our golden opportunity. I want to challenge everybody else. Do the same thing. Put together a program. Bring more people into what we do because we are hanging on by a small thread right now, and we need more people on our side. You know, with all this talk lately about gun control, it occurred to me that I've yet to see a single politician who can explain to me how they plan to take guns away from the criminal thugs who are out there on the streets right now. Oh, sure, you'll hear plenty of talk about how they plan to take guns away from us, us law-abiding citizens. But if you take guns away from all of us legal gun owners, then the only people that will have guns will be the bad guys. In fact, I'm curious. I want to see a show of hands right now. All those for gun control, raise your hand. All right, there's one, two, three, four. Anyone else? Ah, see there, that figures. All the usual suspects. Any questions? Donald Trump seems to have no shortage of supporters, and this one's coming all the way from the UK. John Aquaviva joins us via Skype. Thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you for having me. All right, now before we get into some other topics, let's start off with this Trump video that you made. Uh, of course, Trump is the hot topic here in the US right now. So can you tell us about the video and what prompted you to make it in the first place? And pretty much the reason I made it was because I saw that one of the main things that was being used to kind of attack Trump and still is, is the fact that supposedly he's been changing his opinions for the past uh, year and a half. And I just wanted to show in reality how consistent he's been with the actual core principles and ideas, which is what the American people care about. And I just thought, what better way to do it than taking advantage of the fact that he, obviously being a public figure for pretty much all of his life, he's done countless interviews, and he shared this, these opinions uh, live TV before, so why not make a compilation? So I made the, the compilation with a guy called Chris Hermsey. Uh, we, we both managed to find these different clips, put them together, and yeah, it's been really well received. And obviously with the push that you guys gave it when you uploaded it to your website, it's gone pretty much viral now. And how long did it take you to compile? And there's a lot of clips in there, so how long did it take you to get all those and uh, put them in a clip? Um, it took about, I'd say, a week and a half. Yeah, it wasn't that long, but yeah, I think it was worth it then. I mean, people seemed to love it, and 
it was something that needed to be done. So I don't know. No, no complaints on my part. It was time well invested. All right. Now you're living over there in the UK now. Does there is there a general consensus that you can see regarding Donald Trump? Are people for him, against him, indifferent? Um, the thing with with what's going on in the UK is that people aren't really interested in their own politics, let alone what's going on in America. That's what I see, at least. I mean, when you get the population as a whole, especially millennials in, in, in England, they're not really interested in politics at all. Mm -hmm. So what they will do is they'll just take whatever headline their favorite newspaper or magazine puts out and they'll just roll with whatever it says, whether it's in favor or against. But if you speak to them about his policies and his ideas, they won't have a clue about it. So it's pretty much just whatever, whatever they want to follow. That's pretty much the way it is here. So you're in good company. But also, uh, just quickly, uh, you touched on it there, but any thoughts on Brexit? Do you guys, or you personally, do you feel one way or the other? Uh, well, obviously, I want to I wanna, I wanna leave. I think that's, that's the only way that we can take back control of the country and stop it from turning into something like Sweden, for example. Um, it's something that has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, which I'm pretty confident it will, if it doesn't happen, it will be probably the biggest mistake that the British people have ever done in this generation. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of what I feel is going on, obviously with what happened with the murder of Joe Cox, um, they just completely used that, the Remain side used it for their own political gain. They've been shamelessly uh, plastering it all over the media, trying to win sympathy points. And I don't think it's worked. I think British people are more intelligent than that and they're able to see past that shamefulness and just be able to understand that voting to leave is the best thing that we can do. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you live in the UK now, but you're originally from Venezuela, correct? Yep, born and raised. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that because I run into a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters here. I'm not sure how familiar you are with him, uh, but people basically pushing for a strong sense of socialism. Uh, with Venezuela and what you came from, well, let's backtrack a little bit. With Venezuela, do you like the way Venezuela is right now? To put it to put it mildly, Venezuela is currently hell on earth. Venezuela is the country that has everything in terms of potential. Everything it has some of the most amazing landscapes and sceneries that you could ever imagine. It has endless natural resources and it has completely been destroyed due to socialist policies it has been taken into being currently the country with the lowest standard of life in the world you have people hunting down pigeons and dogs on the street to feed their family you have people desecrating the tombs of people who've been dead for a hundred years just to be able to see if they can find some jewelry to steal to then sell and be able to afford some food you have people killing each other in food lines just to be able to fight over the last bag of flour or the last pot of milk. It is a complete catastrophe, and it goes to show what socialism ends up being. When you leave socialism long enough in a country, it will always end up like Venezuela. That's very good. I'm glad you said that because uh, there are a lot of people here who use Venezuela as somewhat of an example. They say we should have socialism like Venezuela. I'm like, well, it's not. People are killing dogs in the street, as you say. Uh, just to feed their families is not exactly an ideal situation as you describe it there. Exactly. And here, for example, and, and you, something that really bothers me, which is one of the reasons I like InfoWars, I like what you guys do so much, is because you constantly make uh, content and videos and articles about what's going on in Venezuela, something that hardly none of the mainstream media, especially here in England, do. I have seen a handful of a. Uh, of articles and uh, news bits related to Venezuela in the four years that I've been living in England. It is a disgrace. And the reason is because in England, they're trying to push the same kind of socialist agenda that took Venezuela from being a paradise on earth to being hell on earth. You got Jeremy Corbyn saying a couple of years ago that Venezuela is what England should aspire to be. So obviously they're not gonna show how it really is. So. Yes. Now, here in my bio, it says that you were put on a cyber terrorism watch list. Is that correct? Yeah, that was in 2014. We had the longest growing riots. It lasted almost three months every day. Thousands and thousands of people all over the streets and, and all, over the, all over the country in Venezuela just protesting, trying to get rid of the government. And what happened was that during that time, 
the government had pro probably one of the biggest uh, tackle down on critics against the government. So what happened was that people who were posting out messages on Twitter, like I was doing, which was pretty much, I was spreading information about what was going on. Because during those three months, there was hardly no information, no news. I had my mom and my dad living in Venezuela at that time. They were calling me, being in England, to ask me what was going on. Because they, there was no way that they could find out. I knew because I had all my contacts on social media that let me know what was going on. But besides that, the media was completely turning a blind eye to the fact that Venezuela was going through the biggest protest in its history. So what happened was, because of me spreading this information, I got put in this a cyber terrorism list, out of which a, I think it was eight or nine people ended up getting put in jail. These are all people who got put in jail just for sending out tweets against the government. And most of them are still in jail to this day. So it just goes to show the state. Oh, well, how, how long have they been in jail? You said that was a while ago, right? Yeah, it's been over two years now. Oh, two years. Wow, just for sending out tweets. Yep. Jeez, that is absolutely ridiculous. And we got about a, two minutes left here. I also want to talk to you about uh, the mass immigration. Uh, a lot of people going into uh, Europe, the European area over there. And just your personal opinion, we see things on the news, good, bad, and different. Uh, just your personal opinion, uh, do you think that the mass migrant immigration is something good for Europe? I mean, the, the people who try to make the point that mass uncontrolled immigration, especially from countries that have cultures that are completely against our values and our freedoms that we have in the West, is not somehow good or is to be invited or is to be promoted is an absolute disgrace. The fact that people can't understand that when we have so many issues in England that we can't even take care of for our own people in England, such as the housing issues, such as the NHS crisis, when you have all of those issues that are affecting British born people paying taxes in England, and then you just want to add more to that to that equation by bringing in more people with no kind of control, with no kind of skills to be able to obtain jobs, to be able to provide some value back into the country, just let them all in. It is a complete disgrace. Yeah, I hear that because you know nobody wants to be seen as you know uh, discriminating, but you know here in the United States of America we have an epidemic of homelessness, you know, veterans not getting uh, treatment and on and on and on, uh, like you said, job situations as well. And I'm like, well, can we help the people here first? You know, it's nothing against the people in other countries. And yes, we understand that in various countries around the world, the U.S. has had a hand in making those situations worse, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan or some of those Middle Eastern countries. But you have to take care of your own people first. Uh, John Aquaviva, very quick, do you have a website or something people can use to contact you? Uh, the easiest way is just on my social media. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at I am two numerical two skilled. Don't judge me on that username I created it about five years ago. And on Facebook, just put in John Patrick Equaviva and you'll find me there. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, John. Thank you for having me. That's it for our show. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.